Let us pray. O Lord, startle us with your truth this day. Open our hearts to your word. That hearing we may believe, and in believing we may act upon it according to your will for our lives. For this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. I wonder how many of you are familiar with that story that was just read from Genesis. When I was in Sunday school as a young child, this was one of our flannel board Sunday school lessons, the Tower of Babel. We were handed a flannel tower and there were these people that were going up the tower and there were clouds that we could put on there and the lesson was too much pride goes before a fall. And as important as the first reading was from Acts chapter 2, what I want to focus on this morning for Pentecost is the story from Genesis. One of our theological forebearers, John Calvin, said that the stories and poetry of Scripture ought to be the lens by which we look at the world. Therefore, if we put on the lens of this story from Genesis 11, what might we discover? In his book, Mandate to Make a Difference, Walter Brueggemann claims that the world gives us a dominant script that we live by, that we understand our lives through. And the dominant script that we're given promises to make us happy, to make us safe, secure. And it primarily uses the forces of consumerism, militarism, and extreme individualism. Yet the dominant script, Brueggemann claims, says nothing of God. Nothing of faith. And so where does this dominant script leave us as we journey through life? Brueggemann says that script does not make us whole. There's something missing. So as the church, as the body of Christ, as we celebrate the birthday of the church today, what can we learn from this story from Genesis? Is there an alternative script in this story? a life-giving script that reminds us of what God desires for us. We work hand-in-hand with the Spirit this morning on this Pentecost to discover what these words may have to tell us about an alternative script for life. What is going on in this story from Genesis? Why does God choose to act the way God does? in this story of the Tower of Babel. After all, it's not likely that we had been behaving well before this story shows up, before this fifth and final story of what we call the primeval stories in Genesis. Think about the stories that precede this one. Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. Cain kills his brother Abel. Then we get the revolt of God's people, and that leads to, well, almost the extinction of humanity, Noah and the flood. All of this leading up to this story in Genesis of the Tower of Babel. And so these stories of disobedience, they set the stage for today's story, I think. There is something about the same language, using the same words, The story of a people who desperately want to hold on to a simplicity that comes from homogeneity, from uniformity, from all of us thinking and acting and being the same. They want to gain control of whatever helps them feel safe and secure. They're not sure about the future. Maybe they're living in an increasingly frightening world. Now many of us heard the story as children as a warning against humanity's desire to achieve greatness. 
to storm the heavens and displace God with ourselves. We want to, as was read, make a name for ourselves. The tower would stand as an incredible symbol of human achievement. And that interpretation, well, it primarily focuses on sinful pride. And we could easily wear those lenses this morning and look at that story as pride that goes before a fall. We could say it's pride that puffs up the world all around us. But what if there was a different motivation behind this story, behind the tower? What if it wasn't pride? What if it was fear? What if it was anxiety run amok? Because we might perceive of a time when we would lose power and control, when things couldn't come as easy as they did if we all spoke the same language, if we all thought the same way, if we all looked alike and acted alike. The Jewish scholar Ben Jacob puts it this way, the builders do not want to force their way into heaven. Rather, they want to huddle closely together because they fear getting lost. They were scared of the unknown, of the trackless wilderness they saw stretching all around them. They saw strange faces in strange places in a future they could not see. What if it was unbridled fear that motivated them to build the tower? We can wear those scriptural lenses as well here in the 21st century. And when we do, we might empathize with those back in Genesis 11. Strange places and faces fear a future we do not yet know. The fear pops up in political ads about gun violence, gun purchases, gun control laws, partisan politics. The fear pops up in government legislation related to inflation and rising gas prices. The fear pops up in churches over dwindling numbers and a perceived loss of power in the world. And on a more individual basis, maybe the fear pops up in the middle of the night when some of us lie awake because we've just had a test for cancer or we're not sure what's going to happen to us next. And it feels like we're living in chaos in an uncertain and unknown future, our ancestors in Shinar might have been some of the earliest ones to feel this loss of control and power, to know this kind of unbridled fear and anxiety, but they were certainly not the last. Here we are in June of 2022, and we see it, we hear it, we feel it all around us. Think of the language that's been spouted over the last few weeks. Replacement theory, that somehow people who speak a different language, who look different than us, who, who act different than us, are taking things away from us. What happens when we get scared, when anxiety creeps in? You batten down the hatches, don't you? You, you huddle together. You try to build whatever you can build, physically, emotionally, spiritually, to keep the chaos out, to make you feel safe again and control again. You aim for security, for homogenization, for centralization, homogeneity. You actively resist anything that implies a scattering or diversification. You stop trusting God to be God and you work doubly hard to make sure that you are with people that are like you think like you, act like you, share the same kind of language and culture we share. You have a real affinity for those folks, and so you gather together. I'm always amazed by the search engines now that lead us to Facebook or other things that pop up in ads. The second you click on anything, they start to know everything about you, and then the ads get familiar, right? And the topics that get put in your Facebook page from Politico or Newsmax or all the other things are from your point of view. There's a real affinity, a real sense of security, 
when you hear and read things that you identify with. In our spiritual ancestors' case, they took that fear and anxiety and used it to fuel, well, the building of a central city and a great tower. Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower with its top to the heavens. Make a name for ourselves, they said. The theologian Bernard Anderson wrote, there is something very human in this portrayal of a people who attempted to preserve unity. That dimension of life that underlies human conflicts. And what they feared was geographical dispersion, fear of linguistic and ethnic diversity, fear of differences of race, religion, culture, custom. Anderson writes, their intention to hold on to the simplicity of that primeval past, or as he called it, the good old days, collided with the purposes of God. God who acts intentionally to disperse us from our chosen center. Why would God want to do such a thing? All our spiritual ancestors wanted to do was to build a central city, to build a tower, so that they could just stay together in one place. What's wrong with that? They were convinced that if they could just batten down the hatches, if they could build the walls, the ramparts, make enough laws, if they could keep a sort of homogeneous uniformity of language, culture, family structure, religious tradition, if they could hold on to all that, all would be well. They would be safe, they would be happy, they would prosper. Their children would flourish. That was the dominant script. They would simply do whatever they had to do to keep from being dispersed. They could legislate out the chaos, the diversity, the complexities. The problem with that And the reason God acted the way that God did was the dominant script was not God's script. God's script had them fulfilling a divine purpose, a commission. Early in Genesis, God says, go, multiply, fill all the earth. Not just Shinar, not just one place, not just one ethnic group, not just one central homogeneous identity. God's script had them choosing courage, the faith to venture out, to resist fear and anxiety over an unknown future, to resist a dwindling sense of power and control. In this story, humankind strove to maintain simple uniformity, God desires complex diversity. Though humankind sought to maintain a center, God countered that with a desire for dispersion. Though humankind wanted to keep safe, God welcomed nothing less than pluralism. You see this in this story from Genesis and also in Pentecost, in the Acts 2 story. Only a cacophony of languages a diversity of skin color and cultural identities, a full complement of abilities and disabilities, even a variety of religious identities will do. I give kudos to the liturgist on this Sunday for having read all those city names. (laughs) There are a couple readings every year when they look at me and go, not that reading, Rob. God's hope for creation was all of those places. Pamphylia and Asia, Pontus, regions of Mesopotamia and Rome. There is an alternative script to the dominant script that the world would have us live. How do we live today? Do we live with open arms to those who may be different? Can we move past intolerance to tolerance? Can we embrace diverse complexities? That's the hard route, isn't it? (laughs) To deal with people that aren't like us, who don't think like us, act like us, 
seeing strangers or those with whom we disagree, enemies maybe. When we feel threatened, either politically or theologically, it's difficult. We have hard conversations, harder still to live with people who act and think differently. When Barb and I first started dating, I remember going to her house one Christmas, and her family said, we open our Christmas gifts, some of them on Christmas Eve, and I thought, heresy? It's Christmas Day, not Christmas Eve, heresy. We all are different. We have different customs and different traditions that we've grown up with. And sometimes it's frightening to live in a world where we feel like we're not in control, where we, we have to deal with complexities. When we concentrate only on a sense of disempowerment or replacement theory, loss of power, or anger in a world where we feel like we've been left behind. Now that comes easy to huddle together and be with the people that are like us. When we turn on each other or we turn away from each other, instead of towards each other, that's easy. All of those ways of being that resist complexity. It fits perfectly into the dominant script that the world wants to shape us by. Yet as easy as those ways are of being in our world, it was not faithful. It was not living out what God desired. Sometimes we're quick to typecast another as an enemy, letting our differences of opinion tear us apart, families, churches, communities. But none of those ways are ways in which God desires for us. When we put on these biblical lenses from Genesis, the primarily dominant script holds no power anymore. Fear and anxiety give way to God's grace and God's mercy. For God did not create us to live focused on maintaining uniformity or homogeneity at any cost. It is clear from this story and from the entire book of Acts that God created us to live in an open arm posture. This sees differences and complexities as divine gifts. Our vision of God grows larger when we see different perspectives, when we're surrounded by people who act and think and look differently than we do, our image of God grows. The dominant script is just the opposite. And from the very beginning, God has desired for us to see diversity, pluralism, and complexity as gifts, meant for human flourishing, central to God's script of salvation for humanity. Now the story of Genesis has little flair as the story of Acts chapter 2 does, yet the more time we spend with it, the more time we look through the lenses by which it offers, we realize just how familiar this story is even today. So may we learn from our ancestors in Shinar. May we consistently choose courage and differences. May we consistently open our arms and our hearts to those who are different. For this is what God desires. This is the world God brings to us. For that is who we are. And that will make us, make creation whole. So come Holy Spirit as we celebrate all of our differences. Come Holy Spirit.